welcome. Thank you all for joining us and warm welcome to our District 202 colleagues for joining us for our joint meeting, our first joint meeting in person since uh, we have been impacted by COVID-19 globally. I um, want to go ahead and have you all do you yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. It's really good to be here and um, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for providing a space for us to have our closed session meeting and, and hosting us here um, so we can spread out a little bit. I know it's always a little different to be in a space that's a little different, but um, we just appreciate all the efforts. Um, it's good for us to do this. Um, we do it a couple times a year. Um, it's a way for us to demonstrate in a more open way that we are um, recognizing and collaborating because we do work with the same families. The families come through District 65 and then into District 202. Um, and we know that uh, District 65 really lays the foundation educationally, socially, emotionally, um, for, for students that they bring with them to the high school. So um, it is really important that we collaborate. I do want to say, of course, that um, we collaborate more than these two times that we meet. Um, every, every area, every level of our district is collaborating with colleagues across districts on a regular basis. So the collaboration is more formal this evening, but it's ongoing as well. Um, so once again, um, thank you for the opportunity. Looking forward to some really good conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, can we have a roll call for District, District 202, please? Nancy? Here. Livingston? Here. Monsell? Here. Parsons? Rollowitz? Here. Katerich? Savage Williams? Here. Thank you. Mm, to District 65, roll call. Hernandez? Here. Sue? Here. Halpern? Here. Ken? Here. Lindsay Ryan? Here. Weatherstone? Here. Tanya Rudy? Here. And next on our agenda this evening is our land acknowledgement. Before we do that, um, could we hear from Dr. Witherspoon? Uh, when we get to board and superintendent. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. That's we'll what I just did. Um, the land acknowledgement is right before. Okay. We take the time to acknowledge the, the land that we meet on is the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Ottawa. This land also served as an important meeting place of the Miami, Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, Anoka, Sac, Fox, Peoria, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and other tribal nations. This land has long been a center for indigenous people to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. Located at the intersection of several great waterways, the region has become the site of travel and prosperity. We acknowledge Evanston and John Evans are tied to the massacre of the Arapaho and Cheyenne for railroads and westward expansion, upon which John Evans developed his wealth and founded Evanston. This land was violently taken under settler colonialism through genocide and open warfare. And the region that is now Illinois and Chicagoland is still home to thousands of native people who are actively struggling for sovereignty, self-determination, and justice. The genocidal acts of settler colonialism extended to peoples of Africa and their enslaved descendants. Despite Illinois eventually prohibiting slavery, slavery was an accepted practice before and after statehood. The vestiges of slavery remain present throughout the United States. 
and directly affect the descendants of enslaved peoples, descendants who helped define the African diaspora, rich and heterogeneous community, excuse me, rich and heterogeneous communities descended from African peoples. The genocidal patterns of violence against peoples of African descent and indigenous people have been replicated to exclude and harm people from many intersecting marginalized identities, religious more minoritized, disabled, and LGBTQ identified peoples, BIPOC and, and POC writ large in the United States. These patterns of violence demonstrate that the pursuit to end state sanctioned violence against BIPOC black and indigenous people of color is daily struggle, struggle for liberation from continued social, political, and economic anti-black racism and oppression. Today we acknowledge that we are living, breathing, loving, grieving, laughing, and sharing space on unceded territory. May we learn to honor the historical and contemporary presence and power of the people and their belief that we must be caretakers of the land and waters for the livelihood of future generations. The land that surrounds us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories. It is within District 65's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about black and indigenous peoples and marginalized peoples writ large, consistent with our commitment to equity. We will work towards sharing truth and promoting healing for the sake of our children and families. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgments do not exist in the past tense or only in a historical context. Colonialism is a current and ongoing process and we need to understand our present participation. We encourage everyone consuming this message to continue expanding their knowledge and reduce their harm through awareness of local mutual aid models for survival and engagement with online and local resources, such as the Chicago American Indian Community Collaborative and the Shorefront Legacy Center. And we will move on next to our board and superintendent comments. So I already made my comments, so I'll turn it over. Uh, thank you very much, President Savage-Williams. And uh, Anya, thank you. <laughs> uh, the one thing that I'd like to lift up is uh, uh, the uh, great working relationship that uh, I have with Dr. Horton. Uh, we, we established this relationship uh, in a pandemic uh, where uh, it was a pretty good length of time before we actually even were in the same room together. Uh, but uh, in, in this era of Zoom and this era of uh, 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 other ways to connect, uh, uh, we got it off to a great start uh, right away. And, and I, I thank Dr. Horton for that. I, I know how eager I was for that, but it was clear to me that uh, that he was eager for, uh, for this kind of relationship and collaboration as well. Yes. And so we meet regularly. And uh, um, I, I, I think we really uh, uh, learn from each other mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we explore um, uh, all of the many mutual uh, and, and shared uh, concerns and, and uh, goals that we have. And quite frankly, they completely overlap. Uh, we, uh, uh, we understand the missions of these school districts and the mission for this community and the students uh, that we serve. So Dr. Horton uh, and to your whole board, uh, thank you for hosting us tonight. No and uh, it, it's just a great opportunity to reaffirm uh, the working relationship we have. Yeah, thank you. So I would like to um, first just say, um, Kudos to uh, our educators. We've been able to land a um, land in a better situation from the last time. I know those who've been following the media, media, we've been working with our board and our deck members and our educators to uh, identify and just really connect on the stresses that are plaguing our community in our in our the teaching ranks. Period. So I'm thankful that we've been able to uh, come to a position of support and finding ways to uh, make sure that our teachers. 
are uh, not stressing. Not to say that we can remove it all, but we, we were really conscious and took some time to, uh, to land in a, in a better place. I would also um, like to say thank you, Dr. Witherspoon. We, it's been really welcoming and working with you, kind of taking you taking me under your wing as a rookie superintendent and a veteran. Uh, it's been an honor to be able to work with you and learn about this community and, and the work. Uh, and I also would like to thank, to thank Adila. This production was, that we put together today was really uh, challenging, uh, and I believe it turned out great. Well, we'll see how the YouTube's video look, but it turned out really well. Um, but while, I'm, while we're here in the home of King Arts, um, I had an opportunity, and this is my favorite part of the job. I'm sorry, board members, but this part, meeting with the students, is my favorite part. And uh, I had an opportunity. Um, Ms. Gentles, a fifth grade teacher here in King Arts, invited me to their classroom uh, because they were doing Latinx heritage studies in the fifth grade class. And then a conversation came up about the history of segregation in Evanston. And what was amazing, uh, these fifth grade students really got together and they wrote letters to me and I felt that we're in the home of King Arts, uh, King, Art, King Lab right now and we would be doing a major disservice if we can hear from these same students tonight. So I would like to invite those, our students from the Gentles class to come up to the, to the podium here. They come up to the table, I'm sorry, yep, to the table. And I think it, you all are gonna be thoroughly impressed about the way um, they think about the segregation and redlining impact in the Fifth Ward School. Um, I didn't prompt this, this is, they reached out to me and I thought this was really amazing. So uh, if you all can introduce yourselves and then go ahead and, and read, read one, of, one of the letters. They all wrote their own, but there was also a class letter as well. We can learn a lot from our children and I know we all know that. Hello, my name is um, Zoe Slater. Um, can you get the mic? No. The, oh, yeah. Zoe, can you pull the mic down? Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Zoe. Um, and as you've heard, I'm a student from Miss Dental's fifth grade class at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Literary and Fine Arts School. Um, today I'm talking to you about segregation in Evanston and how we can fix it in our district. In the 1930s, redlining forced black families in one area of Evanston, the Fifth Ward. Redlining is a form of silencing people of certain areas based on their race or ethnicity. Foster School, open 1905 to 1979, was the neighborhood school of the Fifth Ward, and mostly black kids went there. People wanted to desegregate it by turning it into King Lab's Experimental School. When King Lab's Experimental School was getting situated, most of the Fifth Ward's kids' parents from foster schools were told that their kids would go to King Lab's Experimental School. Now, only a, well, now only a bit of them got to go to King Lab's Experimental School, which held 620 kids, and 75% of them were white. These kids did not go to King Lab's Experimental School, that, that did not go to King Lab's Experimental School, couldn't go to Foster because it didn't exist. So they had to take a very long bus ride with other kids in the fifth ward, such as, that went to schools such as Lincolnwood, Orrington, Willard, and Kingsley. This problem, can be fixed. Can be fixed by um, raising money to help buy back or build a new neighborhood school in the fifth ward. You ways to earn money are hosting a, car a car carnival, car wash, bake sale, donation drive, or uh, you can use a couple apps now nowadays. Um, Etc. Um, thank you for your time um, from me. Hello, school board. Um, I think we should add a school to Ward 5. Ward 5 does not have a neighborhood school, which makes it very difficult for the kids to get to the schools, Orrington, Lincoln, Wood, Willard, and Kingsley. After school, they have to immediately get on the bus and go home and cannot stay after school to play with their classmates. 
They especially don't have time to socialize with kids who do not live in the fifth ward. Not all kids can go to the same school as their friends since they are bused to different schools around Ward 5. Kids also have to wake up early so they can be on time for the bus since it's a long ride. The schools are far from their home so they cannot walk to school or bike there. Imagine a kid gets hurt or sick at school and it will take a long time for the guardian to get there because of the long distance. The fifth ward neighborhood is also less of a community because they all are bused to different schools so they don't see each other as much. It makes it harder to make friends at school because you don't ever see them around and you can't get to know them after school because you have to go home immediately. Kids can't participate in school activities on weekends or performances late after school because it is hard for them to get to school because of the long distance, especially if they do not have a car. Kids in the fifth ward can't participate in school activities, but the kids in the neighborhood of the school can. This is not fair, especially since most of them are white. It's not that other races do not want to participate, it's that they can't. It's also with parents. Some parents want to chaperone or help with school fundraisers, but they can't because they live in Ward 5, which is pretty far away. It's segregated even more because the fifth ward is 94% black. That means most of the people not able to participate are black. A way to fix this problem is by rebuilding Foster Elementary, or like buy it back. We could do, we could do fundraisers, including garage sales, bake sales, GoFundMes, etc. By rebuilding Foster Elementary, people in Fifth Ward can have access to a neighborhood school, giving them the option to walk and bike there. Not all families can afford a car to drive to school. This is why, that is why we should rebuild Foster Elementary. Sincerely, Zoe Price from King Arts Fifth Grade, Miss Denton's class. Hello, my name is Annabelle. Um, we have been looking at the Evanston schools that elementary students go to, and I have noticed that there's still segregation between them. Before the redlining happened, whites and blacks lived in all areas of Evanston. But, that, but in the 1930s, that changed. Redlining forced all black families around the U.S. to live in only one area. All the black fam families in Evanston had to move to the Fifth Ward. Redlining made it so banks weren't giving loans to black families to buy houses in. They only gave loans to blacks to buy houses in bad neighborhoods. This caused the fifth ward to be mostly black. Foster school used to be a neighborhood school in the fifth ward. Foster was mostly black students. The Evanston School District closed Foster School, tried to, de tried to desegregate the Evanston schools. Foster School had a very good parent involvement. It made the community really strong. When they closed Foster School, the community started tearing apart. With their attempt to desegregate all the schools, Foster became King Lab Experimental School in 1968. This gave kids all over Evanston a chance to apply. Foster promised some families that they would get first pick. It did not end up that way. 75% of the students were white, and only 35% of the students were black. The rest of the black kids that went to Foster before are now getting bused to Willard, Lincolnwood, Orrington, or Kingsley. Still in 2021, students in the fifth ward are still being bused to Willard, Lincolnland, Orrington, and Kingsley. This isn't fair to the students in Ward 5 because they can't walk. They also don't have time to socialize with students that don't live in Ward 5. The buses that bus students to school are mostly students of color. When the students get off the bus, it's immediate segregation. Students can spend hours on buses. It's also really hard for parents to become involved in the kids' schools because they are so far away. This can be really scary for the students in the fifth ward. One thing we could do to address the problem is either build or buy foster school back. Um, if we want to build a new school, we would have we could have fundraisers, GoFundMe, garage sales, um, etc. We could also make a late bus so they can socialize with other students before they go home. This would help the students in Ward 5 make new friends. Sincerely, Annabelle Connelly. Um, hello, my name is Emma De La Haza in Miss, in Miss Gentle's fifth grade class at King Arts, and I would like to tell you about a major problem that is happening in the fifth ward. The problem is the fifth ward is no neighborhood school and kids are pushed to go to Lincolnwood, Orrington, Kingsley, and Willard. Plus, they can't walk to any of those schools. 
Don't get me wrong, I'm sure those schools are great and wonderful, but it's still unfair to the fifth ward kids. I think some of the changes that need to be made are reopening foster school or building a new one so there can be a neighborhood school in the fifth ward that kids can walk to instead of having to drive or be bused to the other schools. If something happens to a fifth ward student and they need to go home, it will take longer for a parent or guardian to get there because of the distance. Redlining was happening when foster school was open and stopped the year foster school shut down in 1968. So not only were black families forced to the fifth ward because of redlining, but by 1968, their neighborhood school was shut down so their kids were pushed through the schools, I said. Foster school was closed to try to stop segregation, but it only created more. They believed there were more black students in foster school than white, but when they opened King Lab School, there was 30% black students and 70% white students. The effects of closing foster school had a big impact on a lot of families. For example, the pressure of figuring out where your kid was going to go to school or if they wanted to get into the new magnet school, King Arts, the pressure of having to apply to get into that school. If they reopen foster school by buying it back or having fundraisers to build a new school, the problem can be fixed and there will be a school for the fifth ward kids to go to. Not having a school in the fifth ward is bad because not having a neighborhood school is bad for the community. It lowers the chances that a family will look for a home in that neighborhood. A strong neighborhood school attracts families that are looking for an affordable, good quality school for their kids' education and learning experience. This would be great if we could reopen foster school or build a new school. Currently, foster school is known as family focus. And since many people enjoy family focus, we could go with the idea of raising money to build a new school for the fifth ward so everyone can be satisfied with the arrangement if it happens. I hope you like my ideas for this problem. Thank you. Sincerely, Emily. Dear, dear Fifth Ward, my name is Kyle from a fifth grade class in King Arts. I'm here to address problems, the problems with kids of mostly color from Ward 5 and how they had to usually take the bus to school. This means they have less time to socialize with other kids from other wards. You see, my class has been learning about redlining and how it's affecting people now. Me and my fifth grade class have noticed that the, pro the, the problem with Ward 5, so I wanted, to, I wanted you to know about this problem and ways you can fix it. The, the problem, one of the biggest problems is kids from Ward 5 are having less time to socialize with other kids from other wards due to having to go on the bus, on bus, on the buses because they can't walk or bike to school. And it's already hard for kids from lower class to make friends, due to the majority of them being black, due to redlining, making people of color have to, be, have to go, having, making people of color have to go to war five. This is important because they are in the schools of mostly white students, so it's hard for, make, for them to make friends because of the racism in them. And due to war five having no neighborhood school, the neighborhood loses its community feel oh, because all the kids from the uh, wards had to go to different schools. Which makes it even harder for kids from more five to have friends, which could be bad, bad later on for them. Now we are done with that problem, let's move on to the next one, the solution. Now the solution could be to open a neighborhood school for Ward 5, but that would take a lot of money. That would take money, a lot of money. So, if that's not po is not possible, you could add extra time for students from Ward 5 and socialize with students from other wards during the day. You could also add time during the end of the day where they could play and get to know each other more and more. Now, we are at the end of this letter. Thank you for taking your time to listen to, to this. Again. Ms. Gentles in class, those who read, uh, you know, it's an honor to hear from you and, and the thoughts that you put into uh, designing just your ideas around how to address that. It's a problem that us adults have not really been able to solve in 52 years, and you have some really um, amazing suggestions. So we're looking forward to your advocacy, and please invite us, invite me back anytime. I, I love visiting classrooms, so thank you. All right. Families, thank you for bringing them tonight. I know it's quite a challenge getting out the house and coming to a board meeting um, on, a, on a Monday evening. The last thing I would like to share in relationship to our students is that we will be working with, um, with the Evanston City Health Department to set up a, to set up a health clinic 
uh, of immune for the vaccines, and it will take place uh, in the, uh, I would say, I think it's like November 8th, November 9th, for the first round, for the first shot, and then the second shot will be that first week in December. So please just stay tuned for, inf for more information. Uh, Dr. Dicker Safario has been working uh, with the City Health Department, and we're excited to just have that opportunity to uh, have the vaccine clinic for, so, children, five. for, for children 5 to 11 all in, in, the, in the entire city, not just D65 students. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horton. And thank you to the fifth graders that shared their wisdom and talent with us this evening and their families for uh, doing the extra labor of coming here to share their talents with us. Thank you. Um, I did want to invite any other members of the board that might have comments to speak up, if you'd like to do so. Okay, all that being said, I um, am greatly appreciative of our ability to come together um, this evening, and as President Pat Savage-Williams mentioned, we do have other ways of communicating and collaborating and making sure that we have um, a seamless understanding of the experiences that children are having in our community, in our educational institutions. And I'm grateful for these formal opportunities as well as those informal touch points uh, along the way. I'm looking forward to our engaged and thoughtful discussion um, this evening and appreciative of all of the work that's gone into making this happen. Um, the engagement of our board in, in committee meetings, but also the engagement of administrative teams in pulling together a thoughtful and, and visionary um, lineup for us, and to Adila and all of our buildings and grounds folks who set this up and have been spending weeks in making sure that we have a setup that allows us proper spacing and engagement. Um, and it, it, may, it may look easy, but I know that there's been a lot of time and energy and stress that went into this. So thank you all so much. Um, I think that is the extent of my comments for this evening. Um, and I guess I want to also say to our young people that I appreciate them speaking up. I'm inspired by them. And I'm hopeful for our ability as adults in this community to be brave and thoughtful and to get our policy making right and to do them proud and leave them with an institution to lead later down the line that they feel proud of and don't necessarily have to feel apologetic for. Um, all that to say, moving on to our um, civic duty of having public comments at our public meeting. Um, meetings, our members of the public are welcome and invited to address the board during open public meetings. Speakers are discouraged from using the public comment period to air specific concerns about staff members. Being mindful that the public comment period is not a suitable forum for fact finding or resolution of disputes. Rather, we encourage members of the public who have concerns about specific district employees to follow the district communication guidelines found in the student handbook. Please remember to state your name and that you have three minutes to address the board. Also note that it is not customary for the board to respond to public comments. The best way to correspond with members of the board is by emailing us at schoolboard at district65.net. Superintendents Horton and Witherspoon, members of the Board of Education, my name is Richard Wyland. I spent 24 years teaching in District 65 and retired from ETHS in 2016 where I was employed for 16 years as a reading specialist in special education. In reaction to what I observed as too much stress 
and an unhealthy emphasis on winning in youth sports, Good Sports Youth Sports Camp was launched in 1991. Since then, over 12,000 children have attended our camp, which emphasizes sportsmanship and the development of positive social skills through sport. For the past 26 years, we've been located at various sites in District 65, but most often at Lincoln Woods School. 35 former campers have since become professional educators. This past summer, we employed 16 District 65 and 202 staff and 19 high school and college students from Evanston. Since inception, Good Sports has donated over $100,000 in scholarships to Evanston schools and approximately $250,000 in revenue to District 65. Due to the pandemic and changes in District 65 staff, communications this summer were not clear nor timely as our status was not finalized and approved until June 14th, our first day of camp. We request Superintendent Horton designate one administrator to serve as our liaison so enrollment of campers may begin January the 1st. Timely approval will assure parents that the, their child has a spot and permit us to compete with other camps whose enrollment also begins after the new year. Due to COVID uncertainty last year, we were not able to offer scholarships. Provided timely notice is received that camp will be located in District 65 in 2022, we would like to offer each school a scholarship. Finally, we wish to donate 4,000 youth COVID masks, which were not used this past summer as parents were unable to, were able to supply masks for their campers. Thank you for your time and consideration. And in parting, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Witherspoon on his impending uh, retirement. I'd like to personally thank you for all of the support that you provided me, as well as the special education students. And I believe you will be remembered as one of the great superintendents in ETHS history. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. That was very kind. Good evening. Just get microphone set here. Uh, the, the speakers you've had so far, I'm going to be hard pressed, but I'll give it my best effort. Uh, my name is Michael Corman. I reside in Glenview, Illinois, but I used to reside here in Evanston and was proud to live here as my wife was for many years. Um, Madam President, board members, Superintendent Horton and Witherspoon, it's an honor to speak with you uh, today. First, thank you for your service to the community. For the board, I feel a special bond with you as I am a fellow elected school board member in my community. It's a calling. Thank you again. I come uh, before you in the context of see something, say something. I'm sure that we are all too aware that the disruptions to schooling over the last 20 months have been extremely troubling. Our district is certainly seeing behavioral dis disruption, which appears to be especially acute at the seventh and eighth grade level. I am the parent of an eighth grader, as such, I'm especially aware. I had, the honor of uh, I had the honor to spend most of September in two of your school buildings as a substitute teacher. At Haven Middle, I arrived after a frantic call from the representative at ESS the night before, desperately seeking a long-term sub teacher. It was social studies. I love social studies. We discussed the Civil War, Harriet Tubman, and the Underground Railroad reconstruction and the assassination of a president and what might have happened had that not happened. I really enjoyed my time. However, the behavioral challenges that occurred were troubling. Uh, it was not difficult for one student who had challenges to disrupt an entire class. And as a substitute teacher, I struggled to determine how best to handle individual student outbursts. Uh, I can say from my own observations that the hallways have become unruly and mostly undisciplined, especially at the eighth grade level. Uh, there seems to be a significant lack of support uh, for managing the hallways in general. Uh, on several occasions, I was told by various staff members that I should have a walkie to communicate with the office if there are discipline issues. 
This never happened. I'm no shrinking violet. I'm a four-time combat veteran, spent 25 years in the United States Navy, and have a corporate and entrepreneurial background. As I was nearing the end of my sub-period, I saw a significant behavioral decline. Students attempted to depart class early while I was engaged with other students, constantly looking over my shoulder to see uh, if I had an entire class remaining. A general observation, 80 to 85 percent of the young ladies that I interacted with will be ready for your high school. They are hardworking, diligent, and they were focused in chaos. I would say less than 70 percent of the young men will be ready. And I am coming before this meeting because it affects both districts. If I may just have a moment. Uh, especially, I had an especially troubling engagement with an administrator uh, who justified continued poor behavior of a child because the child was the student of a D65 employee. I sent an email to the principal of that building explaining how troubling that was to me. Uh, I'm never one to come without a solution. I think uh, it's in everyone's best interest, and this is probably true in my school district, that more supervision in the hallways between classes is what is needed. Uh, I think it's an incredible stressor on the educators to get ready for the next class while they are dealing with what is essentially chaos between classes. So whether it's ESSER funds or other ways, I would just encourage you to find ways to take that stress off of the teachers because they need to spend time focused on the students that are going to make the transition next year. Thank you. It's an honor to teach in your district. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is the joint literacy and collaborations presentation. Uh, representing us this evening is Dr. Pete Davis. He's our assistant superintendent uh, for curriculum instruction. Number 65 of Dr. Beardsley, who's the assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction. Thank you very much. I feel like that was the batting lineup. <laughs> we so, need a walk-off song. Yep, maybe, we'll see. As long as I don't have to sing it, we're all right. Um, so Dr. Davis and I are here to give an update to the two joint boards, uh, briefly touching on joint literacy as well as some of the collaboration that we've initiated this school year. And we're gonna bounce back and forth to share the presentation tonight. Oh, uh, yeah, Adila, are you able to put slides up? All right. Sounds, sounds good. All right, cool. So we'll be on a momentary technology break and then we'll get you rolling. I will go lead off. Um, as we get ready, I'll just tell a story about my summer. Um, where's your passcode? It's 2816. Uh, so over the summer, uh, Dr. Witherspoon called me into the office and said, I was having a conversation with Dr. Horton and we have a great idea for structured collaboration between the districts. And I said, okay, let's hear it. Sounds, sounds like a plan. Uh, well, that plan uh, under the direction of Dr. Witherspoon and Dr. Horton uh, was to have monthly articulations uh, with department leaders uh, coordinated by uh, Dr. Beardsley and myself. Uh, and you know, the idea here, the headline really is that frequent structured collaboration is the key this year, and it's the key going forward. Uh, we've done collaborative efforts in the past, we've done joint reporting in the past, uh, and what was really missing was this sort of structure where we could have frequent meetings, not just the two of us, but with our teams in job-alike situations. So what you're gonna see tonight is uh, the, the, for the, the fruits of the first two meetings in that, in that structure. We think we have an outstanding structure to really deliver uh, some profound uh, work in the, year, in the months and years ahead. Uh, what you're gonna hear tonight is a short story. You're gonna hear the, you know, the planning and the process. Uh, but we really look forward to, uh, to building that 
throughout the school year. Uh, you know, our districts, you've heard it tonight, we share students, families, uh, a community, and a deep commitment to educational equity. Our teams are building uh, from our shared interests to identity areas for focus work and collaboration this year. Uh, the first two meetings, we build uh, community, we build relationships. Uh, we're learning about each other's work in that exchange, uh, and we're developing shared collaborative focuses for, uh, for our teams. Um, the group has drafted a tentative areas of focus, and we'll continue to refine this focus in November uh, and also be product driven at the same time. Uh, I'm very excited to be doing this uh, professionally. Uh, one of the things you're going to hear about, you're going to hear uh, about our different areas of collaboration. You're also going to hear about our, uh, our framework uh, for our collaboration around Portrait of a Graduate, uh, which I think is, is, is super, super exciting and an opportunity to really align the districts uh, in a way that we haven't been able to do before. So, uh, so that was my uh, lead off bat in there, uh, uh, Stacey. All right, up. well done. I appreciate it. Before we jump into the details of the work around the collaborations that we're setting up for this year, we, are, we know we have some new board members um, and we, with the joint literacy meeting or the joint meeting, we always do touch on joint literacy. And so just really a brief update and reminder around our joint literacy goal which ultimately was put into place in 2014, and it's that District 65 and 202 will ensure that all students are proficient readers and college and career ready by the time they reach 12, 12th grade. And that is a 12-year goal with the intention of meeting that goal in one cycle. Uh, to give the folks, you know, returning and new, just a quick sense, um, due to COVID, we did not administer the test that would have allowed us to deliver the joint report for class of 2024 last year. Um, we are coming back to update that we have completed the assessments that will allow us to bring the data back for the class of 2025 this spring. Um, so essentially, when we return in February, we'll be able to take a look at that data for class of 2025. And as a reminder, um, we have set thresholds that are respective of our individual assessments. We agreed on thresholds for MAP and STAR growth that allow us to define proficiency, and that was work that we brought to these boards approximately two years ago and received approval in February of 2019. And so we continue to be committed and work on the joint literacy goal. We have a lot of very strong foundational work, and particularly as we're re returning to on-site learning for all students. We're really taking a look, particularly in K-2, at places where we need to put extra focus um, for our youngest of learners who, in some cases, remote learning was more of a challenge. Um, and as we will see as we talk about some of our collaborations, we have some additional services and supports that both districts have put into place to address literacy achievement for our students. Um, so that is our update on joint literacy. And we're gonna shift over to talk about the collaborations that Dr. Babis just really introduced us to. Um, to be clear, um, I th really think and agree completely with Dr. Babis that the power of these collaborations are both in structure and in giving some autonomy to our leads to be able to find the most meaningful options for collaboration. And what we really were able to do was to bring our people together um, across curriculum and college and career and allow them to enter, share the work that they are focused on and really be you know, prioritizing and find those powerful opportunities for intersection. And so over these first two meetings, they've had that opportunity to find shared interest and begin to define the work that they're going to be doing. Um, specifically in the area of literacy, um, some of our literacy folks have actually worked together in previous collaborations. We did some work around shared rubrics in previous years and have had some articulation in the area of reading and writing. Um, the team, as they pulled back together, also intersected with Donna Cross, who is our director of MTSS Cell and Assessment. And this group is focused on taking a look at tier one instructional practices that have opportunity to accelerate learning in the classrooms specific focus on discourse as we think about reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Um, they are looking to have opportunities to observe instruction in both District 65 and 202 and identify some of those intersecting and empowering practices for students that can be elevated. Additionally, they're going to take a look at um, uh, interventions that both districts have put into place 
um, one opportunity is to continue to connect to the Reading Lab at 202, and then both districts are, have academic skills centers in place this year. And so looking at the foundational practices, the structures that we have in place, and really being able to build off of and support each other's work. And so the team is looking at that K-12 articulation of both tier one and interventions. They will look for opportunities to visit and to share practice. They will build around, out a timeline. One of the things that I know all of our groups are thinking about is timing and availability because substitutes are short in both districts. So they are thinking about what is the right cadence and timing for this work and timelines will be put in place as we move forward. Um, second, the STEM team, science and math is really the primary focus for that collaboration. And this is a group also that has some foundational relationships due to math articulation work around acceleration. And then Terry Sawa, the lead at ETHS, has been a partner in our science curriculum review and instructional material selection. She's come and joined the teams on multiple occasions. And so this team is actually looking at articulate, clearly articulating learning goals. And this aligns with our District 65 work to move to a standards-based report card and then look for that articulation from our middle school learning goals into the high school. And so the initial practice is gonna be about making sure that we have clearly aligned student-oriented learning goals that are connected to our standards um, across, really looking at the intersection of sixth grade through high school, but then our team will backwards map into our younger grades. Um, and then once those are in solid position, the team wants to have the opportunity to pull student work from both districts to be able to analyze that student work for alignment to those standards and opportunities for elevating rigor and challenge in the work so that we can be really learning together. It's one thing to say what we are doing and to say that we're driving kids to those standards. It's another one to collaboratively look at that work and say, okay, that's what that seventh grader is doing. This is what that 10th grader is doing. Do we have that alignment right? Do we have that staircase right? Do we have the right types of pushes and challenges? And are we thinking about our language and our alignment of practices? Um, so that is where both our literacy and STEM teams are in regards to focus, and they are going to continue to build out the steps of their work and timelines over the next couple months. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about college uh, and career. Uh, we have an interesting uh, time ahead of us for college and career. Uh, we have a new, you know, we have Kirby Callen in District 65 with a team of counselors. Uh, we also have a transition to a new department head uh, at ETHS for counseling. Uh, and that's Cynthia Fuerte. Uh, but we've also been collaborating with Shelly Gates, uh, our CTE director. Uh, and those leaders are focused on college career planning. They're seeking to co-plan and hold college career awareness and exposure programs for sixth through eighth grade students and parents. Those teams' uh, topics include HHS registration, uh, courses, career tech education pathways, electives, clubs, college readiness, and college financial planning. Uh, but one of, the thing, one of the strengths here is a shared uh, use of school links, which is a platform that both districts have in place. Uh, it's a college career uh, ready platform. Uh, so there's a comprehensive scope and sequence for grades six through 12. Uh, there's a portfolio that follows students. Um, I spoke about this, uh, I was so excited, I spoke about this at the uh, District uh, 202 board meeting. When I talked about portion of a graduate, I talked, I was really excited, so, I, so my, my apologies, but. I think this is an awesome, awesome thing to have a single platform that can align the districts in terms of our students' career uh, and college readiness. Um, and you know, we know that that's, that's a technical piece, right? But it also uh, speaks to the adaptive changes, uh, really focusing on career pathways, uh, shifting the conversation from, uh, from uh, college for all to career for all. We think that beginning career exploration uh, early uh, and often is critical to student success. Uh, and their post-secondary planning, uh, which includes college, which includes certification programs, which includes uh, be having a viable post-secondary plan. Uh, we feel that plan can start as early uh, as possible, uh, absolutely in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I always say it's one thing to have a plan to, to want a house over by the lake. Uh, it's quite another thing to have a plan that you can actually execute a viable plan. So uh, we're bringing that thinking and building that vertical uh, piece in there. Uh, we're also going to collaborate, uh, align the counseling program models, uh, including investigating the possibilities of a peer counselor uh, forum for support, professional growth, and problem solving. So actual collaboration among counselors from both districts. 
next, I'll just briefly touch on social science. Uh, social science curriculum leaders, uh, they're focused on fostering relationships among educators within their departments across districts to lay the foundation for vertical articulation. It's really important that they invest in actually building those personal relationships among teachers uh, within the districts. Uh, the belief is that if they take that time to build those relationships, we will, that will lead to deeper and stronger conversations about social science content and skills leading to opportunities for vertical alignment and stronger shared practices. We don't want to be in a, the old position where the high school would reach down and say, here's what we need you to do. It doesn't work. We know that doesn't work. It's never worked. It doesn't work when community colleges or colleges and universities come to the high school, and it certainly doesn't work when the high school does that. What we need first, uh, and we've learned this through collaboration with uh, our college uh, partners, is uh, real relationship building and then articulation and then shared practices uh, that are vertically aligned. Uh, that's an adaptive change. Again, uh, the, the technocrat in me would say, we're just going to hand you some things and we're going to do them. Uh, but we know that doesn't work. So we're going to take a much more uh, adaptive uh, approach. Um, those teams plan to gather educators in person uh, to seed relationships prior to moving into vertical articulation and they will focus on relationship building, creating foundation for the work this year with articulation work occurring in the 22-23 school year. And finally, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, our portrait of a graduate work. Um, and here's the headline, and it's a consistent headline. Frequent structured collaboration will ensure a developmentally aligned portrait of a graduate, District 65 and 202. Uh, the key here is frequent structured collaboration. That's the theme of the evening. Uh, the team is seeking to build a developmentally aligned portrait of a graduate for District 65 and 202. Uh, both districts have some foundation in doing work. Uh, I briefed our school board uh, on our plans uh, to develop a portrait of a graduate last board meeting, and District 65 has a working committee focused on the shift to a standards-based reporting report card that includes both practices, habits of, stu uh, for, of a student, 21st century learning dispositions and product indicators. 21st century skills, uh, just for those at home, uh, refer to knowledge, life skills, career skills, habits and traits that are critically important to students' success in today's world, particularly as the students move on to college, the workforce, and adult life. Tony Wagner has written extensively about this among, uh, along with other uh, prominent authors. The District 65 Report Card Committee drafted these indicators last year and the district is scheduled to refine and finalize them this year. Uh, this presents an opportunity to define a portrait of a graduate that has shared big ideas across the two districts, aligned developmentally appropriate description, descriptors and measures. Uh, our team uh, is planning uh, to share district-specific work plans, identify areas of collaboration, including shared community engagement opportunities for feedback on the big ideas and descriptors. Uh, a road show, Stacy. Mm -hmm. uh, we will go out on a road show. Again, uh, but the idea is we will check in periodically. Waypoints are, are critically important. We don't want either district to get too far in one direction and say, no, 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 that doesn't work, or here's how that would look in District 65, or here's how that will look uh, in District 202. Uh, in addition to aligning the portrait, our teams will collaborate on ways to incorporate the portrait of a graduate competencies into teaching and learning uh, in our districts, and we'll investigate the possibility of the very real possibility of using school links, Google Drive. We also have shared Google Drive, so we can do that as well, uh, or another shared tool to allow students to bring their work and learning in these areas with them as they move through the districts. See, we're not just, we're not just transporting a test score with kids. We're, trust, we're, 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 we're transporting student work. We're transporting specific work toward uh, a shared uh, portrait of a graduate. So we think that's critically important. Um, and Stacy, is there anything you'd like to add on that front? I don't think so. I appreciate it. I think you hit the really key points. And Great. so I think at this point, we are able to open up for questions. I, I'd like to start off and say um, this level of collaboration is a uh, I think um, notable and you know highly desired and overdue, and I had to um, stop myself from getting up and doing a little Holy Ghost dance about <laughs> the the Google Drives transferring. Um, I think you know that is the 
level of student, the depth of student knowledge that I hope, you know, all of our, our kids feel like they're moving on with, that they're seen and known and that, you know, instruction can immediately be responsive to what their demonstrated needs and, and interests and talents are. Um, so I'm, I'm really appreciative of this, um, the caliber of, of thought in, in what you all have shared with us. Um, I did have a question about what you shared about the data. Um, you said class of 2025 data in the spring, and I just want to confirm that we're talking about class of 2034 through 2025 data, that we would be getting third through 12th grade so, data. So the so we do bring two things. What we do bring is the, we bring your data that shows the, the class that has moved and transitioned from eighth grade to ninth grade. And we, so we share the map comparisons from eighth grade to the ninth grade. And that's where we do the kind of that study of that we show what percent of the students are demonstrating proficiency in that window across both districts. That's the primary piece that we do bring at that point. And then our districts report our individual map and star reports to our own, to our own separate board. So I find that challenging a little. Mm -hmm. um, when we last well, saw actually, let me this correct data, something too, it because was... there is the piece that does show racial performance in those groups. So there is the comparison, and then we do, if I bring forward, actually, let me double check, because I think, because it is the comparison, and then I do believe we show, let us check on that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when mm -hmm. the last time we got this data, yep. I think was in the spring of, 2020, you know, am I? Yeah. Last yeah, time we brought historical and we brought the comparison for a particular class. Right, but we did not actually, we were not able to compare year over year growth. So we couldn't see cohort uh, performance. And I think what our feedback at the time was is that it would be useful to get that historical content in order to give us context for how cohorts are growing and where there may be systematic gaps where cohorts are not growing as well and how we can think about how this collaboration uh, or or we as individual institutions notice that and plan to address it mm -hmm. so i would particularly like in the spring for us to be able to see the same data we saw previously but with um, some longitudinal look back so that we can look at how cohorts have been been doing and talk about what we have done to notice patterns and, so, and adjust for them. Yeah, and so what I can do, and I'm looking at our February 2020 mem memo, we have two agreements about the data that we would bring. It's the focus of that bridge class, and then we do bring the percent of students that are meeting thresholds across the other grades, third through eight, the ninth through 11th. And so that is, has been our agreement about what we bring in that February board meeting. And so when I put the class of, when we put the class of 2025, that's that group that is now freshmen, and we're showing what numbers of those students met the proficiency thre thresholds in the spring of eighth grade and in the fall of ninth grade, and that's where we've found those intercepting uh, data points. And so we can see how kids are transitioning and that move from one district to the other. And then we do show in racial groups, as well as with IEPs and other indicators, the percent of students that are meeting the thresholds in our third through eighth grade and in nine through 11. So those are the things that were a part of our commitments to the board to deliver in our February reports. your commitment in the spring is to deliver third through eighth grade proficiency levels, is that what you said? And then eighth to ninth grade comparative proficiency levels? That is correct. And then 10th to 12th grade? Uh, the, yep, the language that we use, Danya, if I can kind of, I'm gonna pull through. So we have a comparison of scaled map RIT scores with your scaled star grade equivalent. And so that shows a comparison of students who were proficient or not on map with students that are proficient or not with star. And 
We show that in two different visuals. Um, and then we did share also the spring analysis by grade bands, percent of students who met grade level thresholds, and medium, median RIT or grade equivalent scores. And so we reported on the thresholds, the comparative thresholds that both districts decided upon and had approved in the February 2019 meeting. And so those have been the two sets of data that we've been bringing to that February meeting. And they're disaggregated. They are definitely disaggregated, yep. My race, I think I asked gender. this question, Stacy, the last time we talked about this, but will we make sure that that data also has an analysis by school um, so that we can determine whether there needs to be targeted coaching and support and accountability? Like if, it's, if, we're, if we're looking at that data and we're seeing trends that, that those that are not proficient are coming from certain buildings that we then can provide the right. <laughs> So I think what I can, t I can talk to research accountability and data about that. I think our school disaggregation, we've tended to do in our own individual board reports. Okay. Um, because that's also, we tend to be able to do that in a little bit of a closer timetable because it doesn't require as much of the data work. And so those are things that we're already addressing in our reality checks and um, with our individual schools right now in regards to our fall data. Great. So I think one thing that I feel like we're missing is um, the longitudinal outlook. Um, so part of the joint literacy goal is, I think, you know, shared accountability, but that shared accountability, when we translate that into, I think, why we're all up here, it is about how are kids doing, right? And how are we, um, how are we meeting the needs or not? And we're talking about thousands of people, right, who are connected with thousands of other people. And so we need to think about what data we have that indicates the health of our systems or not in achieving our intended outcomes and not having that longitudinal outlook to, to look back and compare to the present gets in the way of us planning for what's ahead. So I think I, what I, I heard was, you know, an analysis about proficiency, which I appreciate, and, and the grade level analysis, the disaggregated analysis, but what I didn't hear is the longitudinal data sharing plan. Um, and I think that speaks to our ability to do systemic diagnostic, have those types of conversations at the, the policy level. Um, so I, I certainly don't want to put unnecessary labor on, on this, data sharing process, but it's also something we've been talking about for, for years since I joined the District 65 board five years ago. So um, yeah, at, at this point, I feel like we've had enough time to be thoughtful in, in bringing that forward. And I would like to see that in the spring personally to, to help us think about how to make the most out of the collaboration that we're honoring and celebrating. Um, this evening. I think we need the, the proper longitudinal data and, and diagnostic um, conversation in, in collaboration with each other in this public space. Um, Can I make a comment along those lines? Yep, go ahead. Down here, hi. Um, I, I agree um, with what Anya has, the point that she's making about our longitudinal data, and I would you know, just I want to lift up the point that um, these boards back in 2014 made this commitment to a historic joint literacy goal. Um, and when I read the background in the, in the memo here that sort of goes back to that time frame, um, and I was around when we came up with that joint goal was written as a 12-year goal, as you note in the memo. But you know, you spend just a handful of sentences kind of going back to that history. Um, but it's a, it's a deep history. There was a lot of time spent by both districts, both administratively, certainly on the part of teachers um, and staff, um, to take steps towards meeting that goal. 
And, and I just, I want to say, despite all best efforts, this isn't a commentary on anybody's effort. We just aren't where we need to be. Um, and I think that we need to see some comparison of the data to have an understanding, as Anya's already pointed out, about where we need to go and what are the changes we need to make. It's, it's been, you know, quite a while since we've talked about this joint goal and, and COVID um, interrupted some of the work, but it can't be um, the excuse for, you know, not acknowledging that deep history around the goal. And I hope that um, COVID can be an inspiration and I think you're seizing the moment and moving forward. Um, but from a board perspective, we're, we're not in, in, in the operations at the school. So although I do acknowledge and deeply appreciate all of the actions you're taking within the school buildings on a daily basis to collaborate, to confer with one another, to align your work and so on, at a board level, we need to hear, I think, even more, not necessarily less about all the collaboration, that's terrific, but we need to hear more about how the results of the collaboration impact our policy decisions. And that's, that's what's going to be most useful to us. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have anything to say, really, and I don't think it's right that I should, about how many times your teams are meeting and all the details of those those meetings i applaud the fact that you're doing them and you have the expertise to do that but that's not my that's not my work as a board member so so i'm excited i i, I think you know as our board discussed at our last meeting the portrait of a graduate i think is really exciting and i think the ways in which it can align with your work in District 65 are also exciting. But I just, you know, I just want to reiterate that there is this deep history, there is a long stretch, there's a certain degree of frustration. Not, um, I, I'm not trying to be negative here, but a certain degree of frustration with the length of time that has passed with, without a whole lot to show for it. Um, so I just, I, I make that point not to be not to put a damper on anything tonight, um, but I think it's important to understand the historical perspective. And that's, that's much more in the nature of a comment than a question, but I welcome any thoughts you have in response. Yeah, and I think for as far as the team and putting together the memo, um, we had a board agreement on what was to be delivered every February. And so we've been focused on delivering what the commitment was with the board, but we can certainly go back and consider the request around longitudinal. But since we have had board agreement, and I think since we did not report data last February, it, we maybe need to go back and take a look at that data and see if that's delivering what was you know, perceived. Um, but we were moving forward with the direction from the board that was given to us pre-COVID, and that is to bring certain set of reports in February. Um, but we will certainly take a look and we understand the request around longitudinal. So you all are suggesting that we didn't ask for longitudinal data when we met in the winter of 2020? Because my understanding is that's always been the The way we were moving forward was that we had agreement on the sets of reports that were going to be delivered. And when we pulled, to get, uh, when we pulled together to meet last winter to prep reports, we brought the historical that had been asked for and we took a look at what we could not deliver the other two for that, for actually for the class of 2024 or for the year data. And so based on the memo, we were moving forward with those two reports. But again, for the will of the board, we'll go back and take a look at a way to bring longitudinal forward with our class data. So I, I think I would characterize that a little differently. I would suggest that in February of 2020, we asked for the longitudinal data in 20. Yeah, in 2021, that was not able to be provided. So, the expect uh, my expectation was that in the year now, now that we've gone through a cycle where we can have the data that we need again, that we would be getting the data that we asked for in February 2020. 
Okay, I can, we will go back and take a look at February 2020, but we also hear the request for longitudinal here. Thank you. Yep. To put this in perspective, I think it's important that we are talking now about longitudinal data because I have attended, I think, <laughs> since 2014, almost every one of the, these meetings we've talked about the need for the star and the map to communicate. And we have that worked out now. So I think that's huge. We'll go back and we'll look at the longitudinal piece, but I don't want to lose sight of a, a question that was asked, for those who have been on the board, it was asked all the time. I, I, I see Sergio on the, on the, yeah, exactly. So I'm really glad that we're not asking that question uh, because we'll answer that question again. That'll be answered in the report. We'll have that for you. And we'll take a look at this longitudinal we'll find a way to present that to the boards. Should that please the boards and the superintendents? Absolutely. Yeah, and I just want to say that, that again, I appreciate uh, broadening the way we're going to serve students and children in our districts, right? I think, again, I wasn't here for the 2014 decision around decision making and planning around the joint literacy uh, uh, goal. But I think we put all our eggs in a basket trying to get it, all our kiddos to, just to focus on literacy, right? When we know that children can thrive if we take a holistic approach to how we educate them. So to me, again, and COVID kind of reset everything. For me, what's being proposed here is a new path, right? And we can still get our, our literacy goal. We can still learn how children are doing mm -hmm. uh, through literacy. But I see that we can also learn about how, child, how we can map out a child's career, a pathway to college and career. And to me, <laughs> that is, as an educator, that's the point I've always wanted to get to. As a parent, that's what I want to see my kids. I, I want my kid to be a great reader. I also want him to be a great mathematician. I want him to have good critical analysis skills. I want him to have a pathway to college and career. And particularly for our marginalized kids who do not have access to the resources that our more privileged parents have, tutors, uh, college coaches. Uh, here, what I'm seeing is, is again, it's, 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 it's that we're not doing away with joint literacy, but, we, but I really do, we're adding on and really making sure that we're taking a holistic approach to how we uh, address the development of a child through our, both our systems. So again, I, my, kudos to the team. Uh, and uh, for, for, for presenting this plan. I'm looking forward to seeing how this all unfolds and aligning our processes, aligning our, our instruction. I mean, I think, again, you, out, you saw me nodding. I mean, I think that the, the, the critical piece has always been, since I've been on, on, on this board, is that, again, we just have two different ways that we measure uh, literacy. Uh, and, and that has just been the, since 2014, is how I understand it. We well, don't want to adopt STAR. ETHS ain't doing map, so we figured something out finally, mm -hmm. and looking forward to seeing how that looks. But what one, one more interested is, is, is these add-ons here that are really going to tell us a holistic, give us a holistic picture of how a child develops throughout our, um, our, our both our systems. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question, and I'm coming in late to the game, so um, forgive me. I don't know if it is part of the report that will be coming. Um, so I'm thinking about how so many times, whether they're MAP or STAR, um, our kids are, I don't know, there's a misalignment between the grades, their placements sometimes, um, their own sense of self in reading um, or whatever the coursework is. So in that, I'm wondering when you are reporting on the uh, test scores of our students, will you also triangulate some of that information and data with their experiences in school, such as their placement or their grades? Um, and I'm also thinking about how, how can I say this? The effect size of the practices within the classroom, right? So are we mapping the we're always focused on the student, and, and I respect that, but at the same time, we're somewhat pathologizing <coughs> their behaviors by just looking at the score versus what's happening with the <coughs> teachers or what's going on in the classroom. Um, and so I'm just wondering if that's part of the report to also talk about what are the practices that are, in effect, creating or helping to contribute to the scores that you're going to show us. Can I respond to that? 
question? I love that question, <coughs> right? So uh, the work that, that we do, we have to be able to monitor and provide. Um, we gotta have a set of eyes from, from, the, from where we <coughs> sit, um, leadership. And so we have a few practices that we've launched uh, last school year around principles, but we also have some practice that we've launched this year from central office. And so I think there is an opportunity, Dr. Green, I don't wanna have you come to the podium, but she's been leading our, uh, our central office team with, with Dr. Beardsley, Mr. Little, our assistant superintendents, and in going into the classrooms and actually looking at, going into the schools and looking at those practices that you're speaking to that we really need to be able to capture. Um, and I think the way you said this was, as you look at outcomes, and I, this is really important, the outcomes are what they are, but there's some, there's some work that went into whatever the outcomes were, whether they were positive or negative, uh, or not where we want them to be. And so we will, in our district, we will have some, some data on that. I do believe that some of the conversation that they're having, that we're having with 202, is that we'll be doing something a little similar as well, not exactly the same, uh, it, just some ideas of how to put eyes into the classrooms and actually see the practice so that we can say, all right, here are the outcomes. Let's look at what the, let's look at what the planning was from central office, from the, from the teachers, and then scale it back to the actual delivery. And so that's where you really make change. So I thank you for um, asking that. And there's a process that we've been using. It's called um, collab collaborative calibration visits. Uh, and they, they are, they're not intrusive, not intrusive, but we do get into classrooms and, and capture that data. So. Thank you. Joey. I just wanted to add that. Um, a little closer to the mic. Uh, I'm as close as I can get without eating it. The, um, <laughs> I just wanted to add that I think more than ever as I'm listening to this conversation, I know that I need as a father, like I need the vision for our kids between these two systems more than ever. And as easy as it is to point to what COVID did to call it learning loss or speed bumps in the way for kids' experiences, um, I wanna know what those trajectory changing experiences are between both systems that can change the trajectory of a kid's educational career and the outcomes beyond. And that's the focus of the partnership with NERA to try to highlight them through some, through some research in our systems. That's the, um, to your point, like I just, I would love the aspect of this that centers the experiences with the assessment data as a, as a side part of it because there's so many kids having wonderful experiences in school careers who maybe don't have the same data profile. And I, um, I think there's an opportunity here to create a vision for, for what the city deserves their children to have an opportunity to have between this work. And I think it's great that the collaboration's happening. I feel like it should be expected all the time anyway. Um, you know, like I, I just look forward to what the profile of a graduate work kind of brings out. I just want to say that um, I think that this expansion of um, all these areas is really important. Uh, we, we, we've made some progress, and I think we should think about where we were when we started this and, and how far we've come. Um, and I think we've made some progress. I'm feeling like, okay, this is, this is a, a new step, a next step, an important step for us to look at literacy, look at STEM, um, you know, look at college and career. And this portrait of a graduate is one of the most exciting things I've seen in a while. So, um, so I'm hoping that it doesn't take us as long as it took us for literacy, that we've, we've learned that we have, the, we have some tools now and we can use those tools, we can use what we've learned. And I think what we've learned is the importance of collaboration. Pete, I think you said frequent structured collaboration. Um, so, I'm, yes, I'm not interested in, in the meetings and, and how long they are, but I think the outcome of those collaborations um, should, should yield more information um, more rapidly than before. Um, so, so I'm hoping that that's what we'll see. And when we come back together in February, I'm anticipating that we'll have, we'll hear a lot. We won't necessarily hear how much the team met, but we'll hear the outcome of those meetings. And I think it'll be, um, 
a combination of what folks learned about uh, each other, the, the teaching, the learning, the instruction, what has worked, and really how to transition students from one district to another into the career and past this and later, and how this, this information can be useful um, to students as they come into the districts. So, um, so I'm, I'm thinking this is really, this is really good. This is broader, and it's, it's important that it be broadened, that we learn from what we've done so that we can expand it and make it useful. One thing that seems absent, and I'm not sure <clears throat> how we track it, but you know, I'm certainly, I think the pandemic has exacerbated mental health concerns. Um, and so thinking about how do we make sure we're in alignment in terms of social emotional learning and mental health support as well. I don't know if that becomes an additional thing on this list, but to be thinking about how we're, what the strategies are at each grade level um, to meet the, the mental health uh, and well-being needs of our students, I think would be another thing for us to add to the list in our discussions on collaboration. So pulling our discussion together, um, I want to confirm my understanding District 65 has a practice of doing collaboration or collaborative calibration visits. And we are kind of extending that practice to a cross institutional opportunity. We can't speak for 202, but what we are saying on our, on our side, what we can do, uh, I think what was really important to capture the practices that we're seeing in the schools that feed into like these outcomes. So um, I'm not sure, uh, 202, have, I'm sure they have some things too that they do, but I, I can just, I'm just speak into like specifically how we can, I just text the team while we're sitting here uh, on how we can actually capture the trends from our CCDs that would allow us to really align with, with the outcomes to some degree. So that was my point for speaking to that. A possible connection to, to the comment is you know, each team and when we think about literacy, they're focused on doing some shared observations together. And then the STEM team is focused on looking at student work. Both have an opportunity to move in the direction that was raised with that question and comment about the level of rigor of work and shared practices. And so I do think one of the powerful things about this is that the leads are able to find that area of you know, shared convergence that intersects for their work. And we can, as we move forward, just keep asking that question of what's the tangible output, how do we know, and how is that gonna go back into impacting the learning or experience for our students. Okay, so you anticipate in the spring being able to share the data as well as the experiences of the collaborative sharing of um, student work and um, so what I, I want to be realistic because it is October. We do come back in February. Um, and so, you know, we are, the teams are going to, we will bring an update back, but whether they have finished their data collection at that point, I don't want to commit to yet because there are variables in play that we have to negotiate to allow the teams to do this work. It's also important to note that um, the collaborations continue beyond the February meeting. So. That's important. Without they continue all it's year. ongoing. As will be the all the work. It's a good okay. point. So we're, we, we will see an update on collaborative efforts. Um, any possible initial conclusions or findings that would be useful to us at the policy level to consider? Is that fair to expect along with a look at our data metrics and how they compare with one another over time. And so I'll say back what I think I just heard and Pete sound in please, but an up update on collaborative efforts, any possible policy implications and the data reports and response around the longitudinal request. That's, that? what, that's what I heard, yep. Okay. 
and potential for using that as an evidence-based way to inform policy recommendations and decisions to both boards, correct? Sounds good. Well, thank you all, and thank you colleagues for a uh, robust, another robust joint conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. I think it's going in a good place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please extend our gratitude to your teams as well. And I think that's our item in Diaz actually. Yes. <laughs> so um, we're at District 202 action items. The first item is the consent agenda. The consent agenda, which includes approval of minutes from special meeting October 4th, 2021, closed session meeting October 4th, 2021, regular meeting October 11th, 2021, closed session meeting October 11th, 2021, approval of bills, personnel agenda, which includes appointment to, appointments to staff, support staff, change in status, stipends, leave of absence, certified maternity, maternity and sabbatical, resignation operations, and an addendum which includes resignation nutrition services. Can I have a motion, please? I move approval of the consent agenda, but I would like to just take the bill uh, list off of the consent agenda and vote on that separately. So I move everything excluding bills. Okay. So your mo motion is that we approve the consent agenda without the bills and we'll come back Correct. to the bills? Correct. Is there a second? Second. Can we have a roll call, please? Anti? Yes. Livingston? Abstain. Oh, oh, yes, on this one. Sorry. Monsell? Yes. Rolowitz? Yes. Savage Ruin? Yes. Okay, so can we have another motion, please, to approve the bills? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Livingston? Abstain. Monsell? Yes. Rolowitz? Yes. Anti? Yes. Savage Williams? Yes. Thank you. And next on our agenda is our District 65 consent agenda. Donna, you have the motion? I move that the Board of Education amend the recommendations outline the attached group motion and approve the personnel, appointments, leaves, and separations, resolution for dismissal of an educational support staff, resolution to authorize notice to remedy of an educational support staff, October 2021 Board and Committee meeting minutes, destruction of August, September 2019 closed session meeting minutes, July 2021 Treasurer's Report and Budget Amendment, August 2021 List of Bills, Press 107 Policy Recommendations, and Acceptance of Oakton Elementary Gift. Second. Second. Yes. Sue? Yes. Wilson? Yes. Ken? Yes. Lindsay Ryan? Yes. Wetherspoon? Yes. Tanya Yes. Thank you. And Joey. Right. Issuance of school bonds. I move that the Board of Education adopt the resolution providing for the issue of not to exceed $10 million general ob obligation limited tax school bonds of the district for the purposes of increasing the working cash fund of the district and refunding outstanding bonds of the district, providing for the levy of a direct annual tax to pay the principal and interest on said bonds and authorizing the proposed sale of said bonds to the purchaser thereof. Second. Yes. Sue? Yes. Pelton? Yes. Ken? Yes. Lindsay Ryan? Yes. Wetherspoon? Yes. Tanya Yes. Okay. Um, the next item is supplemental tax levy. 
I move that the Board of Education adopt the resolution authorizing a supplemental tax levy to pay the principal of and interest on outstanding limited bonds of the district. Second. Amanda? Yes. Sue? Yes. Hilton? Yes. Ken? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Waterford? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. So, um, can I have a motion to adjourn from this? I move we adjourn. Gretchen, did you make it before I finish the sentence? <laughs> I did. I, I moved. We did. A second. 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 All, of, all, of, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion passes. Okay. And with no further business to come before the District 65 Board, I adjourn this meeting at 8.35 p.m. Wow. Thank you all so much.